Hi, David. I'm really excited to talk to you today about emotional intelligence. I think it's a really key area of growth for financial advisors. We're in very much in a relationship business and being emotionally intelligent is key for us in building our business and working together with our clients for the long term. So to help us get started, can you tell us what is emotional intelligence? Well, thanks, Julie. It's great to be here. Emotional intelligence is one of those funny sounding ideas that uh, people sometimes wonder, how can you be intelligent about emotions? I mean, aren't they just those things that carry us away and cause us to do things we don't want to do? But in fact, uh, being intelligent about emotions is first and foremost being aware of the emotions that we have and what kinds of things we do respond to and react to uh, in our daily lives. And then it's about understanding the emotions of others and how to use that information to connect better and be more intelligent about emotions basically and there are many many models of emotional intelligence out there that have been researched over the uh, the 20th century uh, and um, uh, we use the one that we think is the most useful well, tell us a little bit about the model you like to use. The model that we use was originally created by Dr. Reuven Bar own in the 80s. And this model has emotional intelligence at the center. So there's that idea that our brains process emotions at the same time as cognitive information. Uh, and that's interesting. Uh, and then what, uh, what Reuven Bar own did was he identified 15 different distinct skills and competencies that relate to how well we do with emotions. Starting with this idea of self-perception, how we perceive ourselves. In this model, we've got five categories of skills, and then we've got three different skills in each category. Self-perception is made up of self-regard. How do we regard ourselves, first of all? And then how do we involve ourselves in activities which have meaning and purpose for us? So that's the self-actualization piece. And then finally, in self-perception, there is whether we are or not involved in uh, being in touch with our own emotions whether we know and understand our own emotions. And some people avoid and deny our emotion, their emotions, which is not a good thing, and, uh, and others of us spend time really getting to know how we operate emotionally. Then there's uh, how do we express ourselves emotionally, which consists of emotional expression and assertiveness, whether we say what's okay and not okay for us, and independence, whether we are able to be free from dependence on others. Then there's the area of interpersonal skills and those skills are interpersonal relationships how good are your relationships with others and are they characterized by a depth of connection or are they fairly superficial um, then there's empathy whether we're actually paying attention to the emotions of others then there's social responsibility do we see ourselves as part of this social and emotional world that we live in and recognize our responsibility to actually contribute and give back to that so when it comes to, to empathy I always kind of have a question about that one in particular because I've seen different definitions of what is empathy sure. and um, I'd, I'm actually kind of curious because I've had some people describe it as actually feeling someone else's emotions versus recognizing someone else's emotions and how would you yeah. describe it? We like the idea that empathy is feeling with others so uh, so you have the uh, you're making the attempt to actually try to understand what someone is feeling. And uh, you don't have to feel what they feel, but you, you have to try to put yourself in their shoes. And so the next one on here is, is decision making, which uh, uh, is kind of interesting in the area of emotions because you'd think decision making would be intellectual more than it would be emotional. So tell us a little bit about that. Problem solving uh, is this one competency within the decision making uh, that most people think is probably just about logic and reason. What we don't always think about uh, are our tendencies to avoid making decisions or avoid problems. Uh, we tend not to think necessarily about uh, the worry that we have about problems. Uh, and we tend not to think about uh, getting stuck while problem solving. This is all of the emotional aspects of problem solving and decision making that goes back to how our brains work. That uh, again, we've got these two parts of our brain that among many other parts, but, but the parts that process emotions and the part that processes logic and reason, those always work together at the same time. So we can't separate those out. So you can't leave emotions out of it to make a decision. Uh, you can't um, uh, p use pure logic and reason. It just is not physiologically possible. Well, and that's, that's an interesting point because that's something that you know I hear a lot in uh, in 
the finance world where we think that, you know, when we're making decisions on behalf of our clients, if we're in that sort of position or we're giving advice, that we're leaving emotions off the table, that we, we, we remove all emotion from our decision making process. And I've seen that on marketing that's been produced by advisors as well. And it really, you know, when you think of it in the space of emotional intelligence, it always kind of makes me wonder, is that even possible? Can you actually leave emotions off the table when you're making any kind of decision or problem solving? And the answer is no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> and so much better is to acknowledge what emotions are there. Uh, and so think about it from the, uh, the, the point of view of the, of the, the customer, the client. And, uh, and um, here's someone who is considering uh, putting their trust in another person. Uh, and so uh, think about trust. I mean, it's, it's incredibly emotional. Uh, you know, what is this person doing to, uh, to build that all important trust? Uh, and without trust, the, then you really don't have a relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, um, uh, it, it's much more difficult to rest easy, for example. You know, we want our clients to rest easy, right? Don't worry about it, I got it covered. I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm thinking through that your plan, your plan is safe with me and all of that. And, and it's words, unless it also comes with that all important trust. So there are things that we do that build trust and things that we do that destroy trust. And so we have to be really careful about that. And would you say that those, those two first components that you described about self-expression and self-perception would play into that from an advisor perspective? Because we're often looking at the client's emotional state. Yes. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what part of it do we as financial advisors need to be doing where we're looking inward and being realistic about our own emotions? Yes, absolutely. This is not just for the emotions of the client. This is all about the advisor and how the advisor um, presents themselves, how they express themselves, how they feel about themselves comes through in that advisor-client relationship. Uh, and absolutely, if, um, if that advisor is not expressing themselves authentically, that is, you know, um, talking about what's really going on for them and how they feel about things, then the clients don't have the opportunity to really get to know them and build that critical trust. And that can be really, really frightening for an advisor, you know, if you're dealing with volatile markets yes, or absolutely. difficult situations yes. and just the unknown and yes. we're supposed to be the voice of reason yes. and strength and those yes. sorts of things and yet we're dealing with a lot of the same emotional volatility that a client is yes uh, I think I think it can be really scary to be that vulnerable with a client and yet yes. it's so important to us for building trust yes absolutely so what's reality testing what's one of the components yeah. of that decision-making reality testing is about the fact that we all have our own perceptions of what reality actually is uh, and so what's the shared reality what is the actual reality well the actual reality is what we agree that it is and so in order to do that we have to uh, know and understand this idea of unconscious bias so what are our unconscious biases and how do we become more aware of those make them conscious so that we can then deal with them and we're never going to get rid of unconscious bias because of course we're biased by our upbringing and our socialization and where we come from and all those things but it's to be aware of those biases and how they enter into our decision making so that we can minimize the effects of unconscious bias and be more realistic so be more objective so what are the objective facts etc so that's reality testing oh that is fascinating and then impulse control Impulse control uh, is simply being able to control the temptations to take action. So we have lots of temptations to take action every day, temptation to, you know, eat more than we should and to uh, not go to the gym if <laughs> uh, because it's, uh, uh, you know, we could just hit that snooze button and, and stay in bed a little longer. So to do the things that we want to do requires that ability to control those impulses to do something different. So to take the easy way out etc so impulse control is correlated with patience so to be patient and of course in the investment industry patience is is critical and important and so uh, so an ad, for an advisor they not only have to be concerned about their own impulse control but they have to also be watching for the impulse control of their clients and make sure that people don't 
make a rash decision or um, even an emotional decision. And you know, we can talk about emotional decisions uh, because uh, people do, do seem to react or, or, be ru or run more on emotion than logic, but we need to use both. We need to somehow find the balance between emotion and logic. It's a lot more complex than people think. Yes. And that final component is stress management, which of course is uh, a big concern for anybody, but I think financial advisors, particularly when markets are uncertain or volatile, there's, there's a lot of stress for, for us as advisors and for our clients. Absolutely. Nobody is free from stress. We think we want to be free from stress. I always put this question to, to groups of people. It's like, how long do you think you can lie on a beach and do absolutely nothing. Uh, and, and for some people, uh, that's uh, a, a really great question. And, and I had this one CEO tell me, I don't know, but I'd love to find out. <laughs> uh, and clearly that guy needed a holiday. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, but you know, we think we want to be stress-free, but it's actually not true. We require stress in order to perform. So we, we need some stress, uh, and like a project or an assignment uh, or something that we want to involve ourselves in that, again, that has meaning and purpose connecting back to self-actualization and by by the way all of these things interconnect and work together uh, and so um, we need some stress but not too much and so we have to be able to deal with that stress as it begins to pile up and pile up and pile up we need to have strategies and tactics in order to uh, be able to cope with that stress so that it doesn't ca cause a decrease in our performance uh, and so here are some ways um, that you can see in the model here, uh, flexibility being one of them. So the more flexible and adaptable we are, the better able we're going to be uh, able to cope with the stress that we experience. And because we want to adapt to situations and circumstances, not sort of fight against them, particularly when they're beyond our control. Stress tolerance, is that involved with that self-perception? Stress tolerance is about how much stress you can actually tolerate before you need to start using your coping mechanisms. I don't know if you remember the old stress performance curve, but it looks like a bell. At the far left side of that uh, bell curve is low stress, and then the curve is actually performance against stress. And as we increase stress, we see performance increase. So we, d we do rise to the occasion, so to speak, uh, but then when stress gets to be a certain level, then we see a drop in performance after that and leading to burnout, which of course nobody wants. Mm -hmm. So it's about understanding where we are on that curve, knowing what to do in order to tolerate greater amounts of stress without it taking us out. Uh, so that's uh, when you start using such mechanisms as taking a break, making sure that you're well hydrated and that you're eating right and that you're sleeping right and and, uh, and that sort of thing, that you're not working too long hours, etc. You're even taking a vacation in a couple days yes. on the beach. <laughs> yes, taking a couple days on the beach, seeing how long you can lie on the beach without actually doing anything. <laughs> Very cool. And then the, the final component of that stress management there is optimism. Optimism is about your attitude. So we have a choice in how we view things. And optimism is about choosing to focus on what's positive and what's good and what is the opportunity versus necessarily the challenge. So, um, uh, you know, one way to think about it uh, is, uh, is when we get excited and show enthusiasm and demonstrate passion for something, that's a very optimistic way to view whatever it is that we're viewing. Uh, and when we do that, that kind of becomes attractive to us. We want to be around that kind of energy. And for advisors, if, uh, if advisors can be uh, optimistic and, and excited and enthusiastic about the plan that they've got for someone, uh, then that's something that, um, you know, that's going to be contagious because emotions are contagious. And so, you know, you want your client to catch that enthusiasm uh, for the plan. And it's going to reduce stress. So, so someone, uh, so uh, a client who may be stressed um, when they first meet uh, an advisor, uh, that stress is going to go down as they hear more about the plan, more about how the plan is going to help them, etc. And it's going to be a good thing. Excellent. Yeah, I can see how that can absolutely. And we want to balance stress. that with reality testing. <laughs> <laughs> As we've been talking through this model, one of the things that, that I've been thinking about is that we kind of have to show up as advisors or anybody interacting in any kind of relationship, mm -hmm. if we're going to be effectively emotionally intelligent, we kind of have to show up as a little bit vulnerable, but also 
authentic. Authenticity is important uh, because there are a lot of messages that we get from our society, from culture, from media, from uh, from our upbringing uh, that tell us who we should be. So we listen to some of those messages and other messages we reject, but it's, sometimes we lose who we really are and we lose that authenticity and we, uh, we take on pretenses. So someone might pretend to be what they think an advisor is supposed to be when really that's not who they really are. And what we'd much rather is that people get to know their authentic selves. And so, you know, we use this, uh, some of our EQ skills that we talked about, like emotional self-awareness, to really tap into, you know, how do I really feel about things? What are those things that I value? How, how can I get more connected to that, more connected to who I really am? Uh, and the reason that that's important is that we don't trust people who are inauthentic. Right? We kind of have these little antennas sticking out of our heads and, uh, and we kind of know when people are not authentic and, uh, and we begin to not trust that person when, they're, when we think that they're, that they're not being authentic. Uh, and so um, yeah, we, we would much rather that, that people just said the way things actually were than to try to make up something or, you know, try to, um, you know, allay our fears in some other way. And I could see that being, it can be really vulnerable, right? We're in a, a position of, of being advisors and, uh, and providing you know, this level of support to clients and certainly from those societal, cultural and industry messages, we might get the feeling that we're supposed to be this, you know, super important superior intellect telling the maybe not so sophisticated client what's what. And um, I don't, I, I think sometimes that that can create some some real distance between an advisor and a client yes. where a client may put up some walls, you know, mm -hmm. maybe they're not feeling like they're being respected as a person yes. in that kind of model. And for, for the advisor, they're probably not being authentic, you know. Mm -hmm. We're mostly in this business because we want to help people. And so that's not, we're not trying to create that distance between ourselves and our clients. And yet, you know, we do get those messages mm -hmm. uh, that we're supposed to be the smartest people in the room. Mm -hmm. So, you know, letting those walls down to be authentic yes. and to be vulnerable can be really a little terrifying. Absolutely. <laughs> you use the V word. So the <laughs> V word, vulnerability, it literally means opening ourselves up to harm. Who wants to do that? Right? Exactly. <laughs> so, so I am so happy to see that, that, you know, you see this word being used more and more often and people are getting less afraid of it. Really being vulnerable is being more authentic. Mm -hmm. It's letting people in. It's letting your guard down, as you mentioned. And I love that, letting your guard down. It's like, it's like saying, I don't know. I'm going to find out um, and get back to you. But I actually don't know the answer to that question. That's honest. That's real. That's human. I want to work with that person. I don't want to be with the person who says, I know everything there is to know. And you don't have to go anywhere else because, you know, I am the source. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and clients know that that's absolutely. literally impossible yes. for one person to <laughs> yes. know absolutely everything. Yes. But it can be really terrifying for yes. people to to admit that. You know, yes. as people came to to me for advice, they asked a question that they were certain I could answer, mm -hmm. and my response to them is, "I don't know." Yes, and that can be really scary. But I love your point. I don't know, but I'll find out. Yeah, is probably my favorite phrase. <laughs> uh, and the other the other one is, um, "I made a mistake." Yeah. Because we're human, perfection is not a realistic goal for us human beings. And, and so to go back to a client and say, um, I, I'm really sorry, but I actually made a mistake. And the biggest fear there uh, is that we're going to get fired or seen as less than or, you know, uh, not as good or somehow incompetent. Um, uh, but the actual, actual response is, thank you for telling me that. I, I appreciate your honesty. Uh, and then moving forward with maybe even greater trust than before. Wow, okay, so this person that I have this relationship with is willing to say, 
I made a mistake. That makes them uh, more likable, more trustable, more human in my eyes. That's the person I want to partner with, not the person who is going to make a mistake and then pretend they didn't make one, <laughs> even though you know they did. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, certainly when, when I've had staff members on my team who have struggled, you know, I look for their first mistake. They're going to make a mistake. Yes. How do you deal with that? Yes. Do you say I made a mistake and this is how I'm going to fix it going forward, mm -hmm. or do you pretend it didn't happen? Yes. And that tells me who I can trust more. Yes. And I think our clients have the same perspective. Absolutely. But for all of us, it's really scary. Yes. It's really scary because that's that's our business, and mm -hmm. some people are not going to react well to that. Uh, some people think that vulnerability is laying your soul bare on the table for, <laughs> for all to see. And of course, that's just not what vulnerability is. Vulnerability is going deeper. It's just going a little bit deeper. It's sharing what's beneath that surface. What is that thing that I would not necessarily know about you, but you're choosing to share with me? That's, that's vulnerability. And that's what we all want more of because that's what really matters to us human beings. It's what's beneath the surface. The surface, you know, we, we see the surface and we make up stories about what we see. And yes, we judge books by their covers and it's not right, but we do it because it's a human thing to do. Mm -hmm. But then who's the real Julia? You know, that's what I want to know. That's what's interesting to us. And I think we just all want deeper and more meaningful and better relationships with each other. And I think some advisors might push back on that concept sure. and say, oh, no, well, that's not what my clients want from me. And um, what, would, what would you say to that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, can, I can hear that, uh, that, that defense, uh, which is that's not what I learned about what an advisor should be. Mm -hmm. And really, we battle that frequently in our leadership development with organizations because leaders have certain ideas of what leadership should be. You mm -hmm. know, there, there, are, there are these traditional ideas of the, the leader going into their office and closing the door and, and coming out with the, the grand solution for the, the grand problem. Well, that's just not realistic. That's not the way uh, we should be working together with each other in collaboration. Uh, that, that leader with the big problem should go and get the team together and say, team, what do you think? This is how I'm thinking about this. How is everybody around the table thinking about this? And I want to hear from everyone. Nobody gets to stay silent because that's not a good use of human resources. So how can we involve the team? How can we get as diverse a group together as possible? Because diversity brings difference of reality. We talked mm -hmm. about that. That's one of our best ways of reality testing in a team is to bring in diverse perspectives and diverse opinions and, uh, and, and really use the people that you've got. Uh, that's contemporary organizational effectiveness and the, the traditional view is command and control. I tell you what to do, you do it, uh, and um, uh, there's no creativity, there's just compliance. And we want some creativity here. Humans are very creative if we let them and, and uh, so we want to encourage that kind of leadership. And I think that's a really good point. I think sometimes when, when you're an advisor to a client, you might not recognize that what you are doing is providing leadership. And the same skills that we develop as leaders within organizations or within our families are the skills that we tend to be, or we should be, <laughs> using with clients. Uh, but, and, you know, when someone might as well think back to, well, I'm not going to necessarily bring my client into this conversation about problem solving, but I think we might because the, the client's the expert in them and we're the expert in, in these technical aspects and yes. we need to bring them together yes. to be creative, to find solutions together. And we all love choice. So uh, you, you might, uh, as an advisor, you might be making a decision that you think is in the best interest of your client, but if you can go back to your client and say, listen, we have some options here, explain those options and have them being involved in the, in the decision, so much better. Yeah, well, they're um, more bought into yes. the decision personally. And uh, yeah, that can just be something, if it goes sideways at some point, as some things sometimes do, they yes. can feel like they were a part of that decision. It wasn't just something handed down to them. Yes, and then sometimes as the client, I'm just gonna say, what do you think? Because I really don't know anything about this. And, I, and so, you know, what would you do if this was your decision to make? Right, and that's where that that's, empathy piece comes in. I think to, to um, you know, offer the opportunity to be involved in a decision, it's really respectful. 
It is, and yeah. it, it opens up those lines of communications yes. even further. Yeah. So as, as our role is changing from being primarily transactional to now being much more relational, uh, what role would you say compassion starts to play in our relationship with our client? Compassion and empathy are closely related in terms of emotional intelligence and whereas empathy is you know really paying attention and caring about the emotions of others, the compassion uh, actually means the removal of suffering. That, that's kind of an interesting thing and and so uh, how do we remove suffering? Well we help right we are of service we uh, and I think I think that's why a lot of advisors do what they do because they like to be of service they, yeah. they like to relieve the suffering of their clients and it sounds dramatic but but really if you if it's not so dramatic when you think about it from a client point of view Absolutely. I'm worried about my future right I'm suffering because I don't have a solid plan I, I that's my suffering is I don't have a solid plan so I want an advisor to work with to part partner with uh, on the development, the creation and development of that plan. And then I want to stay in touch about that plan because things change and, and, and I, I want that, that connection, that solid relationship uh, as well. So, so I think that, um, uh, that advisors um, are compassionate. I, I think that, uh, and, when, and how do you demonstrate compassion? Uh, you check in frequently, right? It's like, how are you doing? How's it going? And, um, uh, and you know, letting people, you know, sharing information is, is another way, again, of, uh, of keeping that suffering at bay. So w we don't want suffering. We want people to fe be feeling confident and good about uh, their plan and, uh, and, and what's happening and the service that they're getting, et cetera. So, so yeah, um, having compassion for, for others. And, uh, and it's not just advisors and clients, interestingly, and of course this goes all directions, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, this, is, this, this is advisors with their colleagues, their peers, their supervisors. It, it goes in every single direction. Absolutely. Yeah, how can I have compassion for the people that I work with? So I think that kind of leads into the the testing that people do, which is uh, I think called EQ. Yes. The difference between the term emotional intelligence or EI, we sometimes call it, and EQ, emotional quotient, is that emotional quotient is a measure of how well or how poorly you actually do with the skills of emotional intelligence. And yeah, you're, there, are, there are many tools available, including this tool that we've just spoken about mm -hmm. uh, on the market for, uh, to help people with awareness around where their skills are. And I can see that being really, really useful to just identify you know, where do I need to do some growth? Where can I build up my strength in each area? Because I can't imagine that there are people who just show up and they have perfect emotional quotients. <laughs> At the same time, uh, and, and uh, Julie, you may, you may uh, have heard this before too, uh, there's no such thing as no EQ. <laughs> people, <laughs> say, <laughs> people say to me, my boss has no EQ. Well, it's actually not possible because uh, if you think about it and think about the model that we just talked about, we develop these skills in spite of ourselves. So, uh, you know, as infants, we scream, we scream and cry, uh, and and people stuff happens for us. You know, we express ourselves, and people come running, and so it leads to interaction and relationships. And then every decision is it, it, we make, we learn from, uh, and uh, and so we go through this process in spite of ourselves. And our emotions are hardwired and built in. So so they're there, whether we want them to be there or not. Emotions are there, and then it's about knowing and understanding how we. We operate emotionally, knowing and understanding what kinds of behaviors or actions bring people closer to us and which actions push people away from us. And then we want to pull in the people we want to pull in <laughs> and push away the people we want to push away. But we want to do that in a way that's effective. Yeah, and I can see that being really, really important for, for financial advisors because, of course, we are very much a relational business more than yes. we are a transactional business these days anyways. Yes. And, uh, and I think it's an important area of growth for all of us because, as you say, we need to bring people towards us, the right people, and <laughs> we need to you know, move people away from us that we don't want around us. But also, we need to be able to do it in such a way that that works for everybody that we're not having you know angry clients leaving us that we're that we're feeling really good about the relationships that we have so what are some of the key ways that you would 
recommend that advisors might be able to grow in these areas? It's this self and other kind of uh, of uh, focus. So we, we want advisors first and foremost to get to know themselves. What are your personal values? What do you want and, and what do you aspire to? And are you using those gifts and talents that you've got in the right ways to get that sense of fulfillment at the end of a day? Feeling like, okay, so that was a good day. You know, I got to do things that I really enjoyed doing, that uh, I got to do things that I have a passion for, uh, etc or not and and then if not you know how can we begin to move towards more and more of those things that that fuel us and give us energy and that, that we are passionate about so it's about understanding those things first and then teaching them how they operate emotionally so understanding how you impact on others uh, getting uh, feedback from the people around you, asking people, what sorts of things do I do well? What sorts of things do you think I can improve? Uh, and really understanding that. Uh, and then understanding more and learning more about relationships and more about some of those relationship skills like empathy, uh, which is really paying attention to what's going on for other people. So how would we as advisors start to get a handle on what our own current emotional intelligence really looks like? Well, there's uh, a number of ways, um, but I'll tell you what I think is the sort of more precise kind of systematic approach, and that is to use an online assessment tool like the Emotional Quotient Inventory. So you go online, you answer a bunch of questions, we produce a detailed report with scores in these areas. And then you can see you know, which areas you're strong in and so that you can leverage those areas and then which areas you might score a little bit lower in, which might be areas for targeted development. And then with respect to how you go about developing those areas, <laughs> that is working with a coach. That's the very best way to improve emotional intelligence. And so um, uh, it's you know, having regular meetings, uh, by, usually by telephone. A lot of the work that we do around the world is by telephone and talking with people about things that they can do to improve in these various areas. And so we put together a development plan and then, then we monitor the development plan, hold people accountable for the steps they're interested in taking. Like a personal trainer. Yes. <laughs> So once we know our areas that require improvement, what do we do? What's kind of our first step in each of the five areas? When we're thinking about self-perception, uh, this is about how do we talk to ourselves? We all talk to ourselves, right? That little voice in our heads. Do we talk to ourselves in a nice supportive way or are we focusing on the things that we do wrong and are kind of critical and harsh with ourselves? So paying attention to self-talk is number one. Number two is in self-expression is are we sharing how we're feeling with others and particularly are we saying what's okay and not okay for others in terms of how they treat us. So boundaries are important. What's okay and not okay. That's important for self-expression. Mm -hmm. In interpersonal relationships it's about how can we deepen the relationships with others. So, okay, we have this relationship. I'm going to share more with you. I'm going to share deeper with you. And that's going to, you know, create that strength of connection. It's going to deepen that connection. Uh, and then, so that's interpersonal relationships. And then when we get to decision making, it's about, you know, are we facing what we need to face? James Baldwin said, nothing changes without first being faced. And that's just so important. It's like, are we, you know, turning our attention to that big elephant in the room type problem that just exists there? Or are, or are we avoiding and denying that it's there? Mm -hmm. uh, finally, in the stress management area, do we have the right amount of stress in our lives? If we have too much, and of course a lot of us feel like we do, what are we doing to respond to it? How are we responding to deal with that stress? And that's usually self-care. How are we caring for ourselves in order to deal with the stress that we have to deal with on a daily basis to be successful? Okay, and so what is just one thought that we can leave with the advisors today about EI? You know, I think the, the most important uh, one thought um, uh, is um, that everything is emotional, that that's just the way we're wired. Uh, we are wired to, at a very basic level, approach or avoid. So we either approach those things that we think are relevant, useful, helpful, uh, important for us, or we avoid those things that are threatening, 
dangerous, um, you know, just uh, opportunities for us to fail, be humiliated, etc. We avoid. So we either approach or avoid at a very, very basic level. And so to be more aware of those kinds of things that we approach and avoid is going to be really important for us. And to understand how we operate emotionally is going to improve our, um, uh, how we view ourselves first and foremost. So just our, our own self-satisfaction. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also it's going to determine how we show up in relationships, how we communicate with others others and, and ultimately uh, will determine how effective we are at whatever we turn our minds to. Wow, well, that is a really great first step in what I suspect will be a long journey for all of us. Thank you so much for joining us today, David. I think Everybody Advocates really appreciates the information you've brought to us today. Thanks so much, Julia, for the opportunity. Appreciate it.